Adigache padang santang sangkaru pesaman sukang. Friends, I want to continue this Nitta uh, Dhamma talks. The meaning of the stanza that I recited is um, Metta Vihari Yogi Ku. Asano Buddha Sasane Adigache Padang Santang Sankaru Pasaman Sukhang Bhikkhu who lives with Metta and pleased with this dispensation of the Buddha. attains blissful state, peaceful state by overcoming sankara. Sankara vupasama, sukha. He experiences, enjoys, attains the happiness of uh, appeasing Uh, sankaras. One may wonder how one, when one practices metta, loving friendliness, that one can uh, overcome sankaras or transcend sankaras. Sankara means uh, many things that which uh, keeps us bound to samsara is called sankhara. Samsara is a repetition of birth and death. Sankhara is the uh, backpack for that journey. So we travel use that backpack. Heavier, the bigger the backpack, the longer the journey. So the longer we go, uh, we need the big backpack. That big backpack is our sankharas. More sankharas we have, longer we can go. So as we go, we must uh, use up these sankharas, use up our backpack. And uh, in fact, that is literally true. It is very much like backpack. Backpack is a heavy thing, you know, it is not very easy. If you go longer, the backpack has to be very big to have sufficient provision for the whole journey. And the longer you go, it heavy, it becomes heavier. At the beginning, something, you know, when you start, uh, at the beginning, uh, anything becomes light, but as you go on, carrying on your shoulders, it becomes very heavy. So, so I use this term uh, backpack uh, for this reason. You don't find it in any uh, text or commentary, but I think it's very meaningful uh, simile. Anyway, sankhara is that provision that we use for this uh, samsara, traveling samsara journey. But if somebody practices loving friendliness, that individual would be able to eat up this sankara, this backpack, and reduce it and make it light. That is the meaning of this stanza. And this is the reason why the Buddha said all wholesome activities, wholesome thoughts, words, deeds, begins with metta. Like not loud enough. Or oh, people at the back cannot hear. Can you hear 
na nail mo let me bring it closer I think it's, now it's alright can you hear me now? can? ok <laughs> alright so Now let me uh, give you, tell you a, a very uh, a traditional uh, uh, story, which is very popular among Buddhist uh, tradition. The story of how Siddhartha Gautama became Buddha as Gautama Buddha. Many eons ago, he met that time his name was Sumedha. He uh, heard the reputation of a Buddha called Deepankara Buddha. And Deepankara Buddha drove thousands of people for his sermons. And he was so uh, popular. And then uh, Sumedha uh, wanted to go and see him and when he uh, saw him at the very first meeting with him and listening to his uh, first Dhamma talk he was uh, ready to attain the, the full enlightenment, Arahantut. But he heard the Deepankara Buddha's sermon. In that sermon, Deepankara Buddha said, Now, if you practice perfections, ten perfections, in a mediocre level, you can become an Arahant. If you practice these ten perfections in a superlative degree or no, comparative degree, higher level, you can become a Pachyaka Buddha. Pachyaka Buddha is, uh, uh, some people translate Pachyaka Buddha as partially enlightened. But I don't like that term, partially enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> but they are fully enlightened, with one little uh, shortcoming. That is that they are unable to teach. They are unable to teach because in samsara they have not trained themselves to teach. You know, like all of you are listening to Dhamma talks. How, can you all give Dhamma talks? Eh? No? <laughs> I don't think all of you can give that talk. Maybe very few. So you keep becoming shy and shy and shy. <laughs> you never give them at all. And you never teach. But you have tremendous knowledge. All the things you need is in your mind. But unfortunately you cannot teach. Why? You have not trained yourself to teach. And that goes on as a habit in samsara. Not only in one life, every life it is like that. Somehow if you break through this habit, this uh, bashfulness, and come forward, be, you know, up, up front and give talks, little by little you become a good teacher. If you never do that, you cannot do it. So this is, this is the problem with the, with the Pachek Buddhas. <laughs> they attain full enlightenment. Since they have not trained themselves to give talks, they cannot deliver Dhamma. One Dhamma sana, they cannot deliver. That is the only, uh, what you call, uh, blind spot, so to say, uh, Pachek Buddha has. Otherwise, he is fully enlightened. So this Buddha said, 
if one practices these ten perfections in the medium level, you can become Pachyakabhu. But if you practice it in the superlative degree, the highest level, you can attain full Buddhahood, become perfectly enlightened Buddha, if who can teach, uh, preach, uh, advise, and his knowledge is super, the best. Then Sumedha, then he was an ascetic. Sumedha heard this sermon and also he said, Arahanta's service to the world is limited. Pachyaka Buddha's service is still limited. Sama Sambuddha's service to the world is unlimited. Say, today, 2000, uh, almost 600 years, art is passing him, still his service is going on. Because he was able to teach, advise, give instructions, and so forth. There have been many thousands of Pachyaka Buddhas, nobody knows anything about them. Did they attain enlightenment? And Arahants, of course, they have given some sermons, but not as many as the Buddha. So, this Sumedha listened to this Dhamma, Dhamma talk, and he thought, I want to serve the largest amount of people, largest amount of living beings. Now, this moment I can attain enlightenment, become an Arahant. That's not a problem. I have to spend only very few minutes in meditation, I can attain it. So he approached this Deepankara Buddha and said, Venerable Sir, I want to become a fully enlightened Buddha. Deepankara Buddha said, Sumedha, it is not very easy. You need enormous two out of uh, uh, ten perfections. I, I will mention the ten perfections. Out of the ten perfections, two are very difficult to practice. All of them are difficult, but most difficult are two. And you got to practice them, perfect, in order to attain full enlightenment. What are the most two, most two difficult? Metta and Upekka. I give you the reason later on why it is difficult. I gave you some reasons yesterday. There are more reasons uh, that, uh, that make them uh, difficult. Anyway, he said the uh, metta and upekka, loving friendliness and equanimity are very difficult to practice. Then Sumedha said, sir, that is why I won't do it. I want to practice metta and upekka to the highest degree because I want to serve as many as beings are in the universe, just like you do. So Buddha gave, Deepangar Buddha gave him his blessings and said, okay. He said then in uh, so many years later, you will become a Buddha by the name of Gautama. Since then, it is said, this, uh, now he is Bodhisattva. Now Bodhisattvas also are three. One is, uh, uh, preparing to become fully enlightened Buddha is one Bodhisattva that is called Samma Sam Bodhisattva and the other one who is preparing to become a Pachek Buddha, a silent Buddha that is another Bodhisattva and the third is uh, Arahanta Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva who becomes uh, attains enlightenment by becoming an Arahant just like anybody else but don't uh, uh, be little it and don't uh, you know laugh at it, uh, scoff it. But it is a very very important attainment, arantur. But therefore, however, there are three types of bodhisattvas. These three, three. So he became. He wanted to be a samma sam buddha, and he became samma sam bodhisattva. And yawns and yawns and yawns. He practiced these ten perfections. 
you have to have those two perfections in each perfection to practice them. What are the two perfections you need? Metta and Upekka. Ten perfections are, I think um, you all gave uh, Dhamma sermons on ten perfections. I'm not going to give sermons on ten perfections, but I want to uh, show where metta and upekka involved in these ten perfections. Ten perfections, the first is uh, generosity, we call dana. Second is uh, discipline, morality or sila. Uh, third is renunciation, nekkama. Fourth is wisdom, panya. Fifth is perseverance or effort, called virya. Sixth is patience, kanti. Seventh is a, a truthfulness, satya. Eighth is determination, adhitthana. Then the ninth is metta, loving friendliness. Tenth is upekka, equanimity. Now, suppose you want to practice the first one, perfections of generosity. Generosity has uh, uh, one of our members, uh, I gave these topics to our uh, monastics to give Dhamma talks, uh, and they gave uh, good Dhamma talks. And uh, one gave a talk on dana, very elaborate, detailed uh, talk on dana. It takes many, many, many hours to give a complete talk on dana. I'm not going to do that. But I want to emphasize, I, I want to bring few factors where loving kindness is involved. There are three factors involved in dana. That is uh, chitta, khetta, vattu. Chitta means the state of mind. Khetta means the things material things or whatever things you use to share you. What to is the recipient. Now these three uh, are, must be accompanied with loving friendliness and equanimity. As I said, all the ten perfections must be accompanied with these two factors. Now, in dana, when we say chitta, means state of mind. And that also has three levels. Before you give something, your state of mind has to be filled with loving, friendly thought. It has to be filled with equanimity. Of course, it also has to be filled with compassion. It has to be filled with appreciative joy. That means, before you give anything, with the material, there are all kinds of gifts. Uh, giving material things, giving your energy, giving your skill, uh, and teaching Dhamma, which consider, is considered to be the highest gift highest gift. And Buddha said in teaching Dhamma, sabbang dadocha sohoti yo vedeti upasavang amatang dadocha sohoti yo dhamma manusasati. Sabbang dadocha sohoti, one who uh, gives a uh, uh, monastery, temple, 
gives everything because uh, uh, monastery temple is a spiritual center where people can gather learn dhamma learn meditation learn to be very friendly uh, associate with good people only good people are drawn to temples not gamblers i don't say they are bad but uh, they are not going to the temples to do that uh, not uh, butchers not drunkards and so forth they may go to but not going to drink not going to do wrong things all those who go to temples are those who have a good intention to do something good as you presumably sometimes the people may have that intention also that you don't know but primarily that is the purpose so the place where good people are drawn is a temple and therefore when you give a temple you give everything you give that with the thought of loving kindness thought of friendliness thought of compassion thought of appreciative joy thought of equanimity therefore you give everything but buddha said amatang dadocha sohoti yo dhamma manusasati if somebody teaches dhamma he gives ambrosia amata has two meaning one is deathlessness second is ambrosia the considered to be the food of gods amata devana maamruti brahma divine beings food is amrita amrita means ambrosia anyway uh, that is before we give something energy time material things uh, monastery if giving dhamma talk dhamma sermon we never expect anything in return when we give a dhamma talk teach the dhamma explain the dhamma never expect even a thank from people let alone any material gift this and that so uh, before giving we have to have that thought why i give these things because i want people to enjoy it that is living thought why i give this because i want to el- eliminate people's uh, suffering compassion is there why i want to give this because i want to see them enjoying it so that is appreciative joy why i want to give this because i want to maintain my balance of mind that is economy so before we give anything we have to have these four brahma viharas in our mind out of 10 perfections two of them are there two brahma viharas are there in ten perfections when we are giving things before we give these things we have to have this thought suppose we start giving we plan to give something 10 years uh, ahead and all these 10 years we think of this noble thought if we plan to give certain things in a week in two days we will have we should have this thought in our mind all the time not to expect any reward from people the, from the recipients so that's a wonderful generous loving compassionate appreciate you equanimous thoughts we have in our mind when we are giving things giving our energy giving our time giving dhamma sermons giving material things while giving at that time also we must have these four dhamma viharas in our mind two of them are uh, metta and equanimity we have to give them with metta with with compassion with loving kindness why suppose when we when we suppose we give something material food for instance we give food we must give the food with metta thinking that uh, may these uh, recipients men women children monks nuns beggars uh, sick people whoever recipients may these recipients uh, be happy 
be free from pain of hunger. May they be able to live long. May they gain strength, physical strength. May they gain mental ability. You know, food, uh, good nourishment is necessary for good mental functioning. Protein and vitamin and minerals and uh, so forth uh, are important for the good health. So we actually let them live in, let them live a good healthy life when we give something. While they are while they are enjoying your meals, you have to think that way. Let them have good meal. Let them eat this. Let them have a good state of health, physically as well as mentally. You have to have compassion at the same time. Don't overfeed them. When you are feeding, and don't overfeed out of compassion, because some people can become very gluttonous, and they can sick, keep fall sick, and don't give wrong food, junk food, because they can be sick. Uh, you have to have compassion for their good health, for their life. So when you give something, give with this thought. And also, while they are enjoying what you are giving, I am talking, thinking of food. Uh, for example, I mean, you can give thousands of things. You can give a, you know, dress. Uh, you can give a uh, shirt or robe or cap or shoe or whatever you give. When you are giving, you like to see the person using it. When you when you give it, you like to see the person enjoying what you are giving. That is appreciate your joy. You appreciate. The person would say, this is wonderful. I like this very much. Not out of greed, but that person appreciates what you give. And you appreciate that person's appreciations. Then, uh, you, have, you, have, you also should have uh, uh, equanimity at the time you are giving. That is, that is most difficult, very sublime state, very high state. Uh, your equanimity should be uh, not to become very proud that uh, you have given something and they are enjoying, others don't give anything and then you are, for, you are very superior to others. Or you are giving something and they are recipients they seem to have certain obligation to you because you give. You know, always uh, recipients have a certain degree of obligation to the giver. Giver enjoys the gift more than the recipient. But you should never think that, oh, I give something and uh, therefore I am better than that person. You have to have an equanimous state of mind. Suppose somebody enjoys what you give, and somebody does not enjoy at all. The person takes it and puts it aside and never uses it again at all. And still you should never become disappointed, have equanimous state of mind. Then, after giving, after giving, whenever you think about it, you become very uh, happy. You are, you become very, uh, you, you have uh, metta for the recipients. Uh, you have friendliness. Uh, and you have uh, compassion. You think about with compassion about the, the recipient. Uh, and you think about, th you think with uh, appreciative joy, you enjoy when you think about the pleasure, joy the other person had when you gave. And you have equanimous state even after giving. So, these four Brahma Viharas uh, should be um, included, not should be included, automatically, naturally in, it comes into your mind before you share something, while we are sh sharing something, 
after you have shared something. Now this is what is called chitta, the mind. Then I mentioned three factors. Chitta, what to you give, or the dhamma you give, energy you give, skill you give, whatever you give, that is the thing you give. That also has to be earned with Brahma Vihara. That means uh, uh, you have earned something with loving friendliness to give, to share with somebody. You have not, uh, the thing if you have stolen from somebody, if you have got it from a very cruel means, snatched it from somebody and uh, suppose you got something in a very dishonest way, that is not uh, earned in a, uh, with the friendliness, with loving friendliness. What you have given, what you give also has to be earned with loving friendliness, with compassion, with appreciative joy and with equanimity. And also the recipients, the third is called, uh, uh, the third fact is recipient. Vattu, uh, chitta, ketta. Ketta means the field, field where you sow the seeds. Here, the recipients are the, are the field where you sow this seed of gift. And you have to have a, a loving kindness towards the recipient. You have to have a compassion for the recipient. You have to have appreciative joy for the recipient. You have to have equanimous state of mind to the, towards the recipient. If you give something with anger, disappointment, I give you an example. Sometimes people wonder how can we give something with disappointment or anger. Suppose uh, <coughs> these are all hypothetical examples. Don't take them uh, literally. But this is although hypothetical, it's also possible. Suppose you have a child. You dearly love the child. And you have uh, saved something, put something aside for the child. Open a bank account or some something you have set aside. Wrote, wrote a will or something. And all of a sudden, child dies. You are disappointed, depressed, full of sorrow, grief-stricken, very angry. Why my child died? I did all, I saved all these things for my child and so forth and so on, you keep thinking. And now, look at your, look at the things that you have saved for the child. Then you think, what is the use of this thing? I throw it, give to somebody. I don't want to keep this at all, not even to think about it. Give away, give away. You give it away in anger. Not out of love, not out of respect, not out of generosity, not compassion, nothing. But with anger you, because you don't even want to think of what you have said or think of the child, that every time you think about it, you feel uh, upset, disappointed, and angry. Or, on the other hand, you have something you have something given to you by somebody, and uh, you get upset with that person, get angry for one reason or another. So you this thing you have, and you don't want to keep it because every time you look at it, you remi remember the person who <laughs> gave it to you. You hate the person so much, you don't want to keep this, you give it away. That you 
to in anger. This is how we give things away in anger. And therefore, when we give away things, don't give things away with anger. Giving service, giving energy, giving skill, whatever we give away, don't give away with anger. Give it with loving friendliness, metta. So, this is the first perfection. When you look at each perfection, each perfection has to be practiced with these four Brahma Viharas in mind. Second perfection, sila, morality, discipline, certain principles in life. You practice, uh, Buddha said to bhikkhus many, many times, bhikkhus practice, uh, live a, a life of loving friendliness towards people who support you. Practice your uh, seal, practice your discipline, your morality, with out of loving friendliness towards people who support you, with compassion for them, with appreciative joy for what they are, uh, how, how they are enjoying your life, and with equanimity you practice this. And this goes with the perfection of uh, perfection of morality, perfection of discipline. And uh, all other perfections that I mentioned, all of them have to be practiced this way. So when uh, Sumedha, ascetic, heard this sermon, he thought, it is very difficult. And but I have enough loving kindness I want to develop loving kindness, appreciate your joy, compassion, equanimity. I want to cultivate. So from that time onward, until he attained the state of enlightenment, the uh, amount of lives he was born and the amount of times he practiced this are incalculable. They are called asankhaya, cannot be counted, incalculable uh, length of time in samsara he practiced them. And as I said the other day, he practiced them and practiced and practiced and practiced until he reached perfection of each of them. And then he attained enlightenment. So attaining enlightenment of that type is not very simple not very easy. However, if you have enough loving-kindness, enough patience, equanimity, you can cultivate it. So then, after attaining enlightenment, he said, uh, Buddha so Bhagava Bodha Dhamman Deseti. That having attained this state of enlightenment, he taught the Dhamma to enlighten others out of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Muddha so Bhagava. Vimuttaya Dhammang Deseti, having liberated himself from all psychic irritants, he went on teaching people out of loving kindness, compassion, for them to be liberated from all psychic irritants. Danto so Bhagava Dhammataya Dhammang Deseti, having tamed disciplined himself, he taught others out of loving-kindness, compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity, for their taming, 
their mind. Then, Santo do so Bhagava Samata Dhammang Deya said, having been peaceful and calm, he taught the Dhamma to other people to make them peaceful and calm and happy, out of compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy and so forth. Parinibhuto so Bhagava Parinibha Naya Dhammang Deya said, that is very important thing. Parinibhuto so Bhagava, Parinibhuta means uh, uh, some people uh, without um, thinking very much about Pali or not knowing Pali well, translate Parinibhuta means uh, having passed away. Parinibbana means uh, passing away, Parinibhuta. Uh, if you say uh, Parinibhuta is having passed away, Having passed away, he taught the Dhamma, doesn't make any sense. When you are passed away, how can you preach the Dhamma? <laughs> Parinibhuta here means having reached the ultimate state of peace. Nibhuta, Nibhuta has a very beautiful meaning. When Siddhartha Gautama was uh, leaving his palace, Uh, <coughs> one of the palace uh, uh, queens uh, that also happened to be uh, uh, one of the consorts of uh, uh, Siddhartha, uh, she saw Siddhartha uh, returning home from his uh, you know, trip to the city on a horse car, horse car, he was coming back. She saw him coming, so normally Siddhartha was 29 years old, he was beautiful, very handsome, very attractive, young, healthy, beautiful person, so she immediately became very passionate towards him, seeing him in the evening. So she said, um, uh, Nibbuto nun uh, Nibbuto nun sopita Nibbuta nun sanari uh, Nibbuto Nibbuta nun uh, samata Yasayang idisapati The Nibbuta uh, means uh, uh, satisfied uh, become uh, accomplished something and come completely satisfied, without anything uh, left out, complete satisfaction. So she said, if a father has a son like this, he is fully, completely satisfied. If a mother has a son like this, she will be completely satisfied. If a woman has him as her husband, she will be perfectly com satisfied. Their Nibbuta means uh, perfect satisfaction, not uh, death. As sometimes people say, Nibbuta doesn't mean death all the time. Their Nibbuta means perfect satisfaction. So, Siddhartha heard this. He had a necklace or ring in him, so he sent it through the charioteer, he sent, it, sent this to her. And she thought, ah, he is in love with me. She was fully satisfied. Now she is uh, utmost happy. But what Siddhartha uh, understood was, now you taught me a very beautiful lesson. You are talking about perfect satisfaction. I am going to give that perfect satisfaction, not only to you, but I am going to give you give that perfect satisfaction to the entire world, to the whole humanity. He thought, this is 
the moment of expressing his loving kindness. Loving kindness towards the whole world. And when, since she uh, initiated, spark this thought in his mind at that moment, she want, he wanted to show his gratitude. To express his thanks, he sent this thing to her. And went home, and that night he left home. And uh, you know, after many years he had attained enlightenment. Anyway, <coughs> uh, so the word Parinibhito uh, Sobhagava Parinibbana Dhammang Deseti means having attained full, perfect, perfect, complete satisfaction of peace, comfort, liberation of his mind from all psychic irritants. He wanted the whole world to have perfect peace, perfect satisfaction, perfect liberation from all psychic irritants. So, therefore he said, metta vihari yo bhikkhu, this is the stanza I used at the beginning, pasanne bu- pasanno buddha sasane adhigacce padang santang sankha rupa saman sukhaṁ. A bhikkhu who practices this metta, loving friendliness all the time, he shares friendliness with the whole world. And that, how can that help for one to go over or transcend Sankara, bring this uh, backpack to an end, exhaust? By practicing loving kindness, how can one liberate himself? Because as I said, practicing loving kindness is one of the uh, Brahma Viharas and one of the factors the Noble Eightfold Path, and it is um, uh, it is a tranquility meditation uh, subject, and also can use as a vipassana meditation. But that alone can become the driving force of uh, attaining full enlightenment, liberation. Why? How? One who keeps the, this thought in mind all the time and develop it to the fullest, greatest extent and attain highest level of jhana, concentration, and then, you know, the thought itself is so altruistic, so wonderful, illimitable, immeasurable, powerful. So cultivating this thought again and again and again, mind becomes full, sat, fully saturated with this thought. And then, after gaining concentration, he thinks, well, Iman cheto vimutti abhisankatan abhisanchetaitan. This liberation of my mind, through the practice of loving friendliness is created by myself. It is created by myself in my own mind. And therefore, it is impermanent. It is impermanent not in the sense that today I practice metta and tomorrow I don't have. Not in that sense. In other ordinary uh, love, today you have, tomorrow you may not have it. Due to certain certain factors, you lose it. You get angry, get upset, separate, this and that. But this is not like that. It is impermanent, not in that sense. It is impermanent because, because it is created by mind. No matter how long we have it, we may have our in, in our entire life. Still, since it is created by our mind, in our mind, it is impermanent because mind is impermanent. The mental factors are impermanent. And therefore, no matter how lofty the thought is, it is impermanent. 
నిరోధ ధమ్మ సబ్బంతం అభిసంకతం అభిసంతి అభిసం చేతీతం తదనిత్యం నిరోధమ్మ దట్ విచ్ ఈస్ క్రియేటెడ్ బై మైండ్ జనరేటెడ్ ఇన్ మైండ్ ఈజ్ ఇంపర్మనెంట్ నిరోధ ధమ్మ ఆఫ్ ద నేచర్ ఆఫ్ డిసప్పియరెన్స్ ఇట్ ఈస్ సబ్జెక్ట్ టు డిసప్పియర్ ఇట్ ఈస్ సబ్జెక్ట్ టు డిసప్పియర్ when we attain higher level of insight but it comes back after the full attainment of enlightenment it comes back in a different form different power different strength without any scruple of stain in it it comes second time it comes as a result of full enlightenment not created by mind first time it comes as a creation in our mind second time it comes naturally because of the pure clear state of mind and therefore when he sees this nature he liberates himself from psychic irritation i mean not only this there are various other things but this is the initial stage so in practice one has to guard against the loving kindness when one practices loving kindness one must practice it with uh, with mindfulness uh when somebody tries to cultivate loving kindness all of a sudden uh, one may direct the loving kindness towards the one who loves passionately if you start loving kindness share uh, directing towards somebody a person whom you passionately romantically love then you are in danger you cannot go beyond that you stop there at that time if that image if that person comes to your mind you say to yourself or you say to that memory please darling <laughs> sweetheart <laughs> my honey please i will get to get you to back get back to you later <laughs> you know i love you <laughs> you, you know i love you <laughs> <laughs> this time i am going to practice something that you also like to practice i am practicing something that you and i both want to practice together not only for the benefit of both of us but for the benefit of all living beings our love is limited between you and me but let us cultivate the greater love for the whole world you tell that thought when that thought that image comes to your mind you tell that thought and ask that thought that image that person in your mind not the person physically comes to you the thought arises in your mind memory arises in your mind experiences arise in your mind you tell them please hold on back up wait <laughs> let me go through this this is exquisite this is very peaceful i share that with you you also will like to cultivate that and therefore when we are both ready we both cultivate that altruistic love for the whole world between you and me and between everybody else in the world so if you are not mindful you get carried away with that thought of sharing your directing your love towards your loving person you don't have to neglect that person you don't have to say i hate that person and so forth but with a loving thought develop another thought to talk to that thought in this way you certainly can can put that thought aside with another loving thought in your mind so that 
it does, doesn't hurt that, doesn't hurt that, hurt that person or you. You are developing it in a, in a very tactful, very skillful way to maintain that love rather than weaken it. Second, loving, practicing uh, compassion. When you try to practice compassion, there is an enemy. That enemy of compassion is sadness. If you are not mindful, when you try to practice, you become very sad. You cry. When a pathetic situation arises, suffering being is there, instead of cultivating compassion with mindfulness, you become, you begin to cry. So you cannot help the person. So you got to bring compassion, what you call insight, mindfulness, and hold back, stop, take a deep breath and say to yourself, well, wait a minute, what am I doing? Am I cultivating compassion or, or am I doing something with compassion or am I just uh, becoming a child, foolish, crying, becoming sad? So there again we need mindfulness. The third, when you try to cultivate appreciative joy, you become, you overwhelm with this joy and become very um, excited without your knowledge. And it is said that you become even giddy with your excitement. Therefore you got to guard your mind against that, using mindfulness. Then finally, when you try to practice equanimity, guard, the, guard it against indifference, neutrality. Indifference is a very cold-hearted, very um, negative uh, state of mind, not true uh, equanimity. True equanimity is the very mature emotion, very mature, grown-up, adult, powerful, supreme kind of just emotion. Just emotion, meaning you are in a very sort of higher uh, position in that uh, state of mind. You are not uh, biased, not falling this way or that way. For that, you got to bring mindfulness to cultivate that. Now, this is how we have to cultivate these four states. And uh, you can see how four Brahma Viharas permeate all our wholesome activities. You can never do anything wholesome without these four Brahma Viharas. Can think of anything you do, anything wholesome. For anything wholesome, these four Brahma Viharas must be the basis foundation. Without them, no wholesome deeds can be done in the real perfect sense of wholesomeness. I think you may have questions. Today, tonight, um, I decide different uh, uh, method. Those who like to write questions, those, those who don't like to ask questions, uh, you know, in person, write them and put them in the box. Others who like to have a discussion, tonight we have a discussion, real discussion. You know, I have been talking this whole, you know, tomorrow will be the 10th day of my talking. And you are just listening. I want to listen tonight and you talk. Oh, I participate. And uh, so let us have a discussion. Ask questions in person. If the answer is not satisfactory, ask counter question. So make it a lo lovely discussion. Uh, I think that also gives you a good chance to talk. I think, I think you are ready for that. Okay? 
So we end here and then uh, start our meditation. You are, who is going to teach yoga today? Okay. Uh, Bhante Sandha will teach yoga.